innate immunity is a set of immune responses that occur almost immediately after infection, either right away or within the next few hours. They are nonspecific defenses. They act immediately or within hours of entry of some foreign antigen, some foreign molecule or organism. This is an overview sketch that has a series of 1 to 12 innate immune functions. And I'd recommend you make your own sketches. This is not an exhaustive list, but this is the major set. One is simply the physical barriers around the outside. Another is the mucus layer in many aquatic organisms and in our mouth and uh, around our eyes and so on. Acid in the stomach, secreted enzymes that can attack and damage or kill bacteria and viruses. Peptide antibiotics, molecules that, for example, may bind to bacterial DNA and block function or to other necessary components of a bacterium. The complement system, a series of blood proteins. Interferons, in which a virus-infected cell releases a chemical messenger to nearby cells, causing them to activate a whole series of genes and express antiviral proteins. Non-specific agglutinins are proteins or other molecules that will bind to uh, bacteria or viruses and stick them together, forming them into a clump. Harmless gut bacteria are an important component of the innate immune system. They outcompete many potential invaders. Phagocytic cells, such as macrophages and neut neutrophils, or eosinophils, they can ingest invading cells or vi viruses, or they can secrete toxins that attack bacteria or multicellular parasites. Mast cells in the body can secrete histamine, which activates an immune response, cell swelling, increased blood flow, and fluid accumulation in tissues that both brings more white blood cells to the area and create space, the extra fluid in tissues, to make room for all those cells. And mast cells also release cytokines that attract phagocytic cells to attack as part of the inflammatory response. Let's go through some of those individually. First are a set of physical barriers, and one is simply the integument. In a vertebrate, it's the skin, and it is simply a barrier that bacteria or viruses can't get through unless there's a break. Second is mucus la layers, and if you want more, I have a video on mucus. These are mucuses. They're proteins, uh, often a mucin, that has side chains of sugars and sometimes some other molecules that are very sticky. They are secreted from what are called goblet cells They are secreted to the outside where they absorb a lot of water. They can either be tethered to the membrane and form a physical barrier that stops bacteria from getting in or when they do get in causes them to stick. The ones that are tethered can actually be shed with the bacteria attached. So having bacteria attached can cause the mucus to be shed. And then there are some that just form mats of sticky material and it's very hard for a bacterium or a virus to get through. They, get, they tend to get trapped and stuck or shed. Next is stomach acid. These are protons, proton pumps that secrete stomach acid with chloride following passively through channels and transporters. And that acid breaks down a lot of microorganisms. While we tend to think of stomach acid as mainly important for digesting food, for breaking bonds in proteins and other molecules for digestion, there are some suggestions that the acid gut is actually more to kill potential invaders, that the acid damages those incoming bacteria or viruses. Next is enzymes, such as lysozyme in the mouth, and there are enzymes in gut. There are proteases secreted from amoeboid white blood cells. Uh, and all of those can attack uh, bacteria or viruses. So some of these uh, 
are nonspecific, some are fairly specific, but they will attack viruses and bacteria and other parasites. There, of course, is some collateral damage. So one of the potential problems is that these enzymes can also attack self cells and cause damage to the self. A second set of molecules are secreted defensive molecules. The first of those are peptide antibiotics. These are coded for by genes as longer proteins and then cleaved into the smaller pieces. So I've shown one here that has about 10 amino acids and I'm proposing that this one gets into a cell, binds to some region of bacterial or viral DNA and blocks it, killing that bacterium or virus. To see a bit more, here is an image that I took from a paper, Agitos et al. 2017. Here's the link if you want to see it. And the, they are broadly often called antimicrobial peptides or AMPs. There are several other acronyms that are used as well. And here are some potential attackers, gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. They often have hydrophilic regions and hydrophobic regions in these short peptides. Here are three different ones shown and a lot of different functions. So some of them will bind to required enzymes in bacteria or that are part of viruses and block their functions. They can bind to chaperones, which are necessary for protein folding. They can bind to RNA polymerase, which is required in viruses uh, or bacteria um, to make proteins. They can uh, bind to, ge to genes in attackers and break it down. They can form reactive oxygen species, in other words, OH minus or O minus, depending on what it is, and there are a variety of others. All of these are uh, very reactive molecules that will attack non-specifically the uh, nearby molecules. They can inhibit macromolecular synthesis, they can inhibit cell wall synthesis, they can cause ATP to leak out, ATP transporters, for example. How do they get in? Well, that mix of hydrophilic and hydrophobic region often allows them to fit into a membrane and be moved across it in one way or another. Here are several different mechanisms. Sometimes they go through a protein transporter. So here is a protein, and if this mimics something that is normally moved across the cell, they may go in uh, stealing a ride through that normal cross-membrane transporter. Some of them form pores, uh, two different st styles here, barrel stave and toroidal insertion. We don't really care. The real point is they will insert into the membrane with a hydrophobic region interacting with the interior hydrophobic region of the membrane and charged regions at the ends, form a pore, and then cause our bacterium or uh, virus to leak to death. Another set, if they're abundant enough, will coat membranes and then what they'll do is instead of forming a pore, they'll form just a blob of different membranes. And so they will completely break up the membrane around a virus or a bacterium. So a wide range, and I have schematically shown them as a short peptide, in this case, interacting with DNA, blocking that DNA or causing degradation and killing a bacterium. And they can also attack viruses. The next one, number six, is the complement system in blood, not the best of names. It is a series of enzyme cascades. They're estimated to be 50 plus proteins, and they work in a coordinated fashion, which is why they're called the complement system. There's three different components, and I'm not going to tell you all of the details, but one major category is pore forming proteins, and that's what I've illustrated here. I'll show you that in a minute. They also can trigger inflammatory responses, which will cause local swelling of tissue with fluid that we'll talk about in a moment. And they can label pathogens for macrophages to attack. So let me show you the, one of the main mechanisms of working, which in which I've shown here. Here's some of the complement proteins. They are embedding themselves in the membrane of this poor bacterium, and the bacterium is leaking enough contents to kill it. So here is our target cell, maybe a bacterium, and one of the ways they're activated is through a series of C1 through C9 proteins 
Um, C1 is shown here, and then 2 and 4 here, 3, uh, 5, and then this complex here. So let me run through briefly what they do. One of the ways that this complex can be activated is if the target cell has been bound by antibodies. So here are two antibodies that recognize this and bind to it. So there's a lock and key fit here. And those antibodies binding changes the shape of this part of the Y. That change in shape allows part of the C1 complex of proteins, three different proteins, allows them to bind. It forms this complex made up of C1Q, C1R, and C1S. The details aren't critical, but it is now activated at this point, and it will cleave blood proteins C4 and C2. So C1 complex proteins are blood proteins. C4 and C2, it will turn them from inactive C4 and C2, it's a, these are zymogens, into active C4 and C2. The C1 complex is an enzyme, so is C4 and so is C2. C4 and C2, as they're in their activated form, B and A, they form with three C3 convertase, another enzyme. So C3 is inactive in the blood, here it is activated and we get C3B, the activated form. Then C3B converts another zymogen, C5, which is inactive, into C5B. That cleaves and activates C6, C7, C8, and C9. All of those together form a pore in this membrane and cell contents can leak out. So they lose their concentration gradient and charge gradient of ions, for example, one of the critical problems for a cell with a big pore in it. So cell lysis that kills it. So this is, it's called a membrane attack complex, MAC, made up of C5B, C6, C7, C8, and C9. That's just a part of what complement does. And here's the point, we have a series of blood proteins that each one activates and amplifies. So we get one set of binding here. We can activate a bunch of C4 and C2, which activates even more C3s, which activates C5s. And by the time you get to this pore forming complex, maybe one starting point may have amplified to give you hundreds or thousands of these pore forming complexes, only in the location where this happened. So only in the neighborhood of these invading cells. If you want to read more about it, this is a review from Bordron et al. in Clinical Reviews in Allergy, uh, and Allergy and Immunology, and here is the link. So I have simplified this. So worth knowing it's many proteins, but I've simplified it to show the complement cysting putting a pore in this invader and killing it. The next category is secreted defensive molecules. So interferons, interferons are chemical messengers that are released from one cell. And here is a virus attacked cell. I've shown these as little phage or phage, bacterial viruses, but, uh, that, but uh, a human virus wouldn't have this little bacterial binding region. They would just look like little hexagons with membranes around them. In any case, here is an infected cell. It's maybe in the process of dying, but it's not dead yet. And it releases some chemical messenger. And this is the interferon. It interferes with viral success. Once this interferon is bound to a receptor on a neighboring cell, that neighboring cell through a series of second through a second messenger pathway, it activates transcription factors that go into the nucleus, bind to DNA, and cause dozens and dozens of new proteins to be made, binds to genes and causes many new proteins to be made. And those proteins specifically interfere with viral attachment and or success inside the cell. So they can be inhibitors of things that viruses need and so on. And so while this neighboring cell died because of this infection, um, its neighbors got the interferon message and were activated to reduce the chance that the virus will be successful. It's a very important antiviral defense. And those are interferons. 
The next one is nonspecific agglutinin. Agglutination is to stick together. So nonspecific agglutinin is to be a nonspecific sticky thing. An example is salivary agglutinin, uh, acronym SAG. It is a glycoprotein, in other words, a protein with sugar side chains that is sticky to bacteria, and it is sticky both to gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria, so a great nonspecific defense against a whole lot of different bacteria. And what it does is it will bind to, on one end, one bacterium, and elsewhere, another bacterium. On one and another. One and another. And these form these sticky complexes of a whole bunch of bacteria. And when these bacteria are stuck together in a mass, it's hard for nutrients to get in. It's harder for them to get oxygen if they need oxygen. It is uh, harder for them to replicate. And it's much easier for the immune system to identify this big glob and destroy the whole thing by a macrophage. So that's nonspecific agglutinins. There are a bunch of examples, but you produce salivary agglutinin. It's an abundant protein in your saliva. And it isn't just sticky to bacteria. It is also sticky to some viruses, including influenza A, the flu virus. It sticks to more than one individual, as I've shown here, and glues them together. That inactivates them, smothers them, starves them. Next set of innate defenses are cells, harmless gut bacteria. So here is here's an animal, there's its mouth. It's constantly, of course, taking in food that has bacteria in it. A bunch of those bacteria are potentially toxic, but they are outcompeted by the normal flora, the normal bacteria in the gut, and so as long as you have that normal flora, you don't have a problem. Uh, that turns out to be critically important. We are realizing more and more how important the microbiome is in health, and it isn't just to outcompete these invaders. There also is lots of signaling going back and forth between the two. So harmless gut bacteria are a very important component of the innate immune system. Next is amoeboid defensive cells. Phagocytes is the generic term. I talk a lot about macrophages as the general ones, but there are also neutrophils. Uh, neutrophils are often the first cells to go into an area of damage and to start eating to engulf phagocytose, uh, phagocytose um, invaders uh, or damaged cells. But then macrophages follow in humans within a day or two. There are also toxin secretors that attack uh, many parasites, eosinophils. So if you get a parasite in some part of your body, an eosinophil is likely to be attracted to it by the damage, and then will release uh, uh, molecules like proteases and reactive oxygen species in the area to kill that invader. Of course, there's collateral damage to the rest of you as well, which is why when you get a chigger or uh, some other kind of bite, you wind up with some of the inflammatory response and some other uh, damage. So this just shows a phagocytic cell that is engulfing uh, bacterium. And if you want to see my video on macrophages and inflammation, and what I talked about for macrophages actually is generic. It also refers to neutrophils. These cells can also re release reactive oxygen species and proteases and um, other uh, molecules that attack invading cells as well. The inflammatory response in mast cells, so mast cells are immune system cells that are scattered through a body. They will secrete cytokines that attract amoeboid defensive cells like neutrophils and macrophages and eosinophils, and they secrete histamine and other molecules that induce the inflammatory response. So here is a mast cell releasing cytokines and histamines and causing, this is a blood vessel, it causes blood vessels to become leaky as part of the inflammatory response. So the vessels um, swell, they have more gaps in between the cells and more fenestrations, and so more fluid leaves those 
and tissue that was not swollen becomes swollen with fluid. In addition, they cause larger arteries to open up from being narrower to becoming wider, which allows more blood flow in, even more water, but it also carries in more white blood cells. And those white blood cells, when activated by these cytokines, um, neutrophils and macrophages and so on, will leave a capillary and move in between the cells. If you want to see more on this, you can take a look at my video on macrophages and inflammation.